Hello, all the students. A very good evening to you all. This is Anika Dasim, Jashor University of Science and Technology, and welcome you to the 20th webinar of Jamal Nazrul Islam Astronomical Just. You are watching this live from Jamal Nazrul Islam Astronomical Just official Facebook page. Today, our program is going to be a very interesting one. You have already got to know that our today's selected topic is quantifying galaxy morphology. And I am super excited. I am excited about all the discussion we are going to have here. We have an amazing lady here with us. Our honorable guest, Dr. Kiyam Hassan, ma'am, Astrid, from the Department of Physics of Maulana Azad National Urdu University in Hyderabad is here connected with us. Hello, ma'am. A very good evening to you. Hello. Hello. We are really honored to have you here with us. Before we go to you, I would like to inform our audience something more about you. Our honorable guest, Dr. Pia Hassan Ma'am, has done her masters in physics at Moscow State University in Russia. She has done her PhD in astronomy and done an Indo-French postdoctoral research project at Inter, Inter University Center for Astronomy and Astrophysics and also worked as DHT women scientist in Osmania University in Hyderabad. Before we have an amazing session, I'd like to inform our viewers that our today's program will be divided into two parts. In the first part, we'll enjoy an amazing session by Dr. Priya Hassan Mann. And in the second part, we'll be running a live Q&A. So write down your queries right here in the comment section. Sam, a very good evening to you again, and we are really thankful that you accepted our invitation and for being here. How are you doing, ma'am? Thanks. Thanks, Anika. Thanks so much. And thanks for the kind introduction. And um, I think I'll start sharing my screen, right? Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. Sure. And over to you, ma'am. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you so much. You. So, um, hello, everyone. I'm uh, Priya Hassan. And... Uh, can you see my screen fine? Is it fine? Anika, can you see the screen properly? Ma'am, it's not if it is a screen. We will wait for a second. Okay. It will start it. Yeah, just just confirm that you can see it. And... Yeah, ma'am. It's clear. Can you see the screen? You can see the screen yeah. fine? Clear, oh, ma'am. Okay. Yeah. So thanks, Anika. Thanks so much. And uh, today, uh, hello everyone, I'm Dr. Priya Hassan, and I'll be talking to you today about quantifying galaxy morphology. Okay, this was requested for me, this topic, and I hope that uh, it would interest you. Now, uh, <clears throat> this is very important because in science, when we are comparing parameters, comparing factors, we basically want to have quantifiable factors. By quantifiable, you mean some numbers or some or for some parameters so that you can actually compare, for example, two spiral galaxies. If you have two spiral galaxies, how would you compare them if you don't have numbers representing the properties of the galaxies, right? And that's what exactly we call quantifying. That means we can compare these two spiral galaxies in the terms of some numbers. This is not a qualitative comparison. In qualitative, you would describe them in words, the two differences between, say, two spiral galaxies, and you would say what they look like. But in this case, we are actually talking about quantifying it. So what are the, the typical numbers which we can use to describe galaxy morpho morphology, which can you be used for various studies, right? So I'll talk about these numbers that we have which describe galaxy morphology, and what is the advantage of using them, and how we can actually use them to actually understand much more about galaxies in particular. So I'll explain these things later to you as we move ahead. So let's just, this is my only slide on a historical perspective, just to give you an idea of how our perspective of the universe has changed with time, right? So we started off with a geocentric perspective of the universe. By geocentric, we mean a perspective in which we, uh, we stated that the Earth, it was the center of the universe, geo, and, uh, and, and everything, the stars, everything else goes around the Earth. That was the geocentric theory, which was then changed by the theory of Copernicus, which is the heliocentric theory, where we realized that to explain the motion of planets 
and our skies, it was necessary for us to, to accept that planets were going around the sun and not going around the earth, right? And this was basically established by seeing the orbits of planets. So if you actually look up at planets in the sky, you will see that planets kind of have loopy kind of motion. They go forward, backward, etc. And the only way to explain that was with the heliocentric model of Copernicus, where the sun was the center and the earth went around it. And similarly, all the planets also went around it. And that explained why at some point we felt that a certain planet goes ahead of us or goes behind us. And that's have this loopy kind of motion, right? And therefore, uh, this was the accepted theory, the heliocentric theory. And then a very important milestone in astronomy was Galileo, when Galileo actually turned his telescope to the Milky Way, right? So we have the advent of the, the telescope more than 400 years ago. And that's when what Galileo did is he pointed the telescope to the skies. And that's when he noticed some very interesting things about the skies. For example, he noticed that the band of the sky, which was representing Milky Way, he noticed that this very band could be resolved into stars. It was not a band made up of, you know, milky matter, why Milky Way was called, but it was made up of, of individual stars, right? Galileo also looked at Jupiter and he could identify the satellites of Jupiter and the motion of the satellites of Jupiter as they went around Jupiter. He also noticed the phases of Venus. And all these were observations which were in support of the heliocentric theory, right? Uh, now, after that, after the very important milestone by Galileo, we then have William Herschel come in. And then you have when he actually made very uh, systematic, organized observations of nebulosities, of nebulae or clouds in the sky. Uh, this was basically to look for comets. But along with this, he observed and found a good number of objects which were not comets. They were nebulosities of different kinds. Some of them were external galaxies, which would be resolved into single stars. Some of them were actually nebulae or clouds and all kinds of similar things. Right. And then we had what we talk about a little bit in a little bit, which is called the Shapley Curtis debate, where uh, you had this very important debate in the 1920s, where um, when then the perception of our universe changed in the sense till the time of Herschel, we assume that we are all you know, sitting in this universe, which is the galaxy, the Milky Way galaxy. And it's only after Hubble had his important observations of Andromeda galaxy, as well as spectroscopic measurements of Slipher, Thomas and Hubble, which actually established that these external nebulosities or galaxies which we were observing are objects which are very far away from us, and they are not they are not part of the Milky Way. They are instead objects which are outside the Milky Way, right? These are external galaxies. And uh, that's, that's a brief summary of how our perception of the universe changed. Now, uh, let us just stop and think about our galaxy, right? We are sitting inside a galaxy, which we call the Milky Way. Now, actually, how can we uh, just try to think about it? It's not a very easy problem. It's, for example, you are sitting inside a building and you are trying to build up the structure of that very building. You're trying to decipher what the structure of that building is without actually going out of the building, right? We do not have the, the chance of going outside the galaxy and looking at our position in the galaxy. We have to decipher that while we are sitting inside the galaxy, right? So uh, there were various attempts trying to understand the galaxy. The simplest attempt was made in by William Herschel. And what he actually did is he actually looked at various stars, right? And what he assumed is that all stars are equally bright, right? And if you assume that all stars are equally bright, then he said that the star is fainter because of its distance, okay? And based on that, he measured the approximate distance to as many stars as possible. And based on that, he actually developed this kind of a structure, like you look at this image over here, he developed this kind of a structure of the galaxy where we are sitting in the center. And as he looked in different directions, right, he counted the number of stars in different directions. And based on their brightness, he extrapolated what was the distance to these stars. And based on that, he kind of uh, made a, a model of what he thinks the galaxy looks like, right? So this was the approximate model made by Herschel. Like I told you, 
you have to appreciate it that this is a very important a very difficult job because you are sitting inside a house or a building and you are trying to make up the structure of that building or that house which is obviously not a very easy job so that was herschel's attempt now shapley shapley was in mount wilson observatory and what he did is that he made a more interesting in observation is that by then the time of shapley we already knew that there were certain kind of variable stars called cepheids now cepheids are very interesting variable stars in the sense they have a period in which they vary but their period is proportional to their luminosity okay so what happens that absolute luminosity and therefore what happens if you observe a cepheid and you find out the period of a cepheid you can actually find out the absolute luminosity of the cepheid now apparent luminosity is what you are observing for the cepheid and based on that therefore you can find out the distance to the cepheid and therefore what is there interesting about cepheid variable stars is that for cepheid variable stars you can actually find out the distance to the star by observations of the periodicity right so what shapley basically did is he observed cepheids which are often housed in what are called globular clusters these are groups of stars where are clo very closely grouped together so what he basically did is he found the dis distance to these cepheids in globulars and therefore he found out the distances to globulars and then what he did is that for the sample of 93 globular clusters he this is the sun he actually found out the distance to these various globular clusters based on the cepheid distances and that's when he realized that the cepheid if you see the distribution of the cepheids the sun is not sitting in the center of the distribution the sun, the sun is off center it's somewhere off the center and the cepheids are distributed in this kind of a way around it right and based on that uh uh you know he actually deciphered what is our position in the galaxy we are off center now i must mention to you all that cepheids the word or work on cepheids was basically done by a woman astronomer henrietta levitt and her work is like you can see in this work her work is very important in this her work was also very important in the work of hubble which was actually done which was the important um, you know the basis of the expanding universe theory right so in that also the work of henrietta levitt in cepheids is the backbone of that very work like it is for shapley's work so shapley actually got this but shapley actually made a slight mistake is that in our galaxy there is something called extinction what do we mean by extinction that stars often have a reduced magnitude in the sense the brightness of stars is slightly reduced and that's basically because there's a large amount of gas and dust in our galaxy right and therefore what happens is if you look at a particular star because of the gas and dust between your in your line of sight between you and the star the star actually of the the light of the star gets reddened that means if it is a bluer star it looks redder that's basically because of the absorption of light from the gas and dust and uh, and therefore and also the the brightness of the star is reduced because of this gas and dust and therefore in the case of shapley so what we actually see is that this diffuse interstellar dust it actually causes an extinction or reduction in the magnitude approximately the rate of one magnitude per kiloparsec and therefore if you uh, ignore the effects of extinction you will misjudge distances by large amounts and therefore if you actually see this is the method which was used which is called star gagging you actually count stars and you this thing that to uh, do that but what actually herschel did is he did not look at the whole galaxy he just looked at the neighborhood of the sun in the galaxy a neighborhood of this kind because he could not see the rest of the galaxy because of the amount of gas and dust between us right and therefore if we actually look at the errors which are caused because of extinction what you see the captain universe or the uh, it was you know herschel universe was a much smaller part portion shapley because he was observing cepheids but he ignored the effect of extinction he said that the size of the galaxy is approximately 100 kiloparsecs which was very much an overestimate of the size of the galaxy because he did not consider the presence of dust 
So if you look at Chaplet's universe, you can see it's something like this. And you can see that Chaplet much overestimated the size of the galaxy because he did not consider gas and dust. And now in our present understanding of our galaxy, the Milky Way has a size of about 30 kiloparsec. And uh, that's the approximate size, which approximates to about 100,000 light years. Right? I'm not getting to the de into the uh, definition of light year and parsec. I hope you all do know it. In case you have a problem in the question and answer, you can ask me about it and I'll tell you about it. So that's the approximate size of the Milky Way, which is about 30 kiloparsecs. And, uh, and then as we know, this is not the only galaxy in the universe. As we actually look up at the sky, we actually, through the work of Hubble, etc., you actually discovered that there were many more such luminous, you know, nebulous objects in the sky, all of them which are external galaxies. And uh, what are these galaxies? These galaxies are basically large collections of stars, gas, and dust. Uh, the, they have a mass of about 10 power 9 to 10 power 12 times the mass of the sun. And we should remember that the mass of the sun is about 10 power 30 kgs. So a galaxy would have a, a mass of something like 10 power 40, 10 power 42 kgs. That's the approximate mass of a galaxy. The size, like we know for our Milky Way, is about 30 kiloparsecs. Like I told you, it's about uh, uh, one. It's, it's about 100,000 light years because one parsec is about 3.26 light years. So if I do 3.26. A thousand uh, parsecs. For your interest, here, which is a parsec, is three point two six light years, and a light year is defined as the distance traveled by light in one year. Right. So a uh, light travels three into ten power eight meters per second, and a year has three into ten power seven seconds. Right. So a light year would be approximately nine into ten power fifteen meters. Right. And that would be the approximate distance. Now, the other important thing we need to, uh, to realize that when we look at galaxies, not everything is visible, right? We were talking about visible light. Visible light is only a small fraction of the electromagnetic spectrum. I hope you are aware that there is the electromagnetic spectrum, which ranges for a very large range of frequencies or wavelengths, right? In such a way that wavelength increases in this way towards the redder side and frequency increases towards the bluer side. So uh, what happens is you actually, when you observe these objects or galaxies, if you observe them at different parts of the electromagnetic spectrum, you will see different physical processes which are actually in action. So if you, for example, look at them through the radio or the X-ray or the gamma ray, you will see different components of the galaxy, right? So for example, here, if I show you an image of uh, the Whirlpool galaxy, you can see that, for example, if you were observing it in radio, in radio wavelengths, you would basically see, see the cold gas, right? You'll see the neutral hydrogen, you'll see the cold gas in the galaxy. If you were observing it in infrared, you will see the cool stars as well as the gas and the dust in it. That would be observable in the infrared. If you look in the optical wavelengths, you would see sun-like stars and, uh, that would, that, and objects which have a temperature of about 6,000 Kelvin. If you were seeing it in ultraviolet, you'll see this very hot stars, very young stars, very hot stars. And they are the ones which will be observable in the ultraviolet. If you will look at, at the X-ray part of the spectrum, you'll see objects which are super hot, which are very, very hot. And uh, these would be objects which are about 10 million degrees Kelvin. Or, and uh, it's basically the hot gas which is there. So what happens is therefore we need to observe when we observe galaxies or any astronomical object, we need to look at them at a very large range of wavelengths because that's when you can see the different components of these objects, right? So now when we look at different galaxies through different wavelengths, we can see the different components which make up the galaxy. And that's why we can see that galaxies actually have these different components, which are, like I said, the gas, the dust, the stars, and uh, the other emission, which we get. Here, just for your information, I have an image of uh, we have images of the Milky Way, which are in various wavelengths. So you can see that if it is, if you uh, take images of the Milky of the Milky Way in radio, you would see it something like this. In H1 or the neutral hydrogen line, you would see it something like this. This is all the cold gas which is present in the in the galaxy. This is carbon monoxide, which you can see is very similar to 
the H1 absorption only. You can see there are certain peaks coming up over here. If you look in mid-infrared, you will see the more of the gas in the dust, near infrared again. You look through the gas and dust. But if you look in optical, you can clearly see these dark lanes, right? You can see these dark lanes. And these dark lanes are basically lanes which are caused because of the presence of gas and dust, right? So because you have gas and dust in the galaxy, you have these regions which actually have, you, it's not observable, and uh, that's basically because there's a lot of gas and dust which is coming in the way. And, uh, uh, and, that, and therefore, you cannot see it over here, right? So, uh, and so you can see that. If you look in X-rays, in X-rays now, like I said, you're seeing the hotter objects. And this is the gamma rays, the super hotter. So therefore, through observations of various uh, wavelengths, we know that um, galaxies have various components in them, right? And these components include stars, stellar remnants, clouds of gas and dust. And these are all the kind of objects that we can see in the galaxy, right? Or in these external galaxies. And that's what we know galaxies are made up. I mentioned this already, but I'm slightly repeating this with you is that then there was the question, like I said, whether we have the single Milky Way or many galaxies. And after Galileo observed that the Milky Way is made up of many stars, we act, there was actually a debate, okay, which was held in 1920 between Shapley and Curtis, where they actually argued about, is this the only galaxy or are there many galaxies? This was about a, more than 100 years ago. Last year, we actually celebrated the centenary of this debate. And basically, the debate was, Chaplet said, is that our galaxy is the entire universe, spiral nebulae, etc. They're all part of our universe, and the sun is not the center. Curtis, on the other hand, said that spiral nebulae are galaxies like our own, and the sun is, but he was wrong in the sense he said that the sun is near the center of the galaxy, and this thing. And now we know in today's time that both of them were right in a way, and both were wrong in a way, in the sense the sun is on the center of the universe. That's absolutely right, which Chaplet said. But Curtis was right in saying that uh, spiral galaxies, nebulae are galaxies like our own, which are external galaxies. They are not within our galaxy. Uh, now, let's look at our galaxy. Let's start off trying to study our galaxy because that's our home ground. That is the easiest galaxy for us to observe and for us to understand, right? So let us look at the galaxy. I, I hope uh, some of you all at least are from places which are as um, as good as the place which you can see over here, where you can see the man can actually look at the, the galaxy, right? And um, you can see this image. It, not, not many people are very lucky to actually see skies like this, where you can actually see the Milky Way. But if you do have a good dark sky, it is, you know, it, it's really lucky if you can manage to see the Milky Way, an image like this. Um, some of you all who may be interested with astrophotography, one can actually make nice images of this kind by actually stacking images, right? And uh, you can, you know, there are ways of actually getting images of that kind. So do try to see them if you can. And uh, <clears throat> so here, this is our galaxy. This is our understanding of the galaxy. I'm not going to go into details of how we actually do it, but this is actually done by the method which I was telling you, which is called star tagging. That is, you actually look at stars around you and you use that to actually uh, decipher the, the position of stars and how are they actually distributed, right? So it's a very interesting study of how do we actually know the structure of our galaxy. So you can see that our galaxy here has these spiral arms, right? And uh, <clears throat> so typically it is basically through observations. So we are sitting on a spiral arm over here right? And we actually look at other stars, look at the distances, and actually extrapolate this structure of the galaxy. So that's not an easy job. And there are a lot of people who actually work on it, even today, on actually getting that, right? And therefore, what we see is that our galaxy is a spiral kind of a galaxy, which has spiral arms, but it is a flat galaxy. It's a disk-like galaxy. So if you were to look at it edge-on, you would actually see it looking flat like this, right? So this is what is called face-on, where you can actually see it like this, where you see the spiral arms. But if you look at the galaxy like this, this is what we call edge-on. And that's when the galaxy looks something like this, right? And uh, 
so if we were to like i mentioned the sun is sitting on one of the outer spiral arms of the galaxy and uh, <clears throat> the galaxy is made up of a disk right the disk is the flattened part and the disk is where we have all the young stars young stars are all sitting onto the disk and it's the flattened part while the outer part this is called the bulge of the galaxy or the halo of the galaxy the bulge is the center part this outer part is called the halo of the galaxy and in the halo of the galaxy is where we have the globular clusters i already spoke to you about globular clusters globular clusters are dense concentrations of stars but these stars are older stars and they are situated in this part which is called the halo of the galaxy over here the stellar halo and if you were to actually look at it you would see the diameter of the visible disk like i told you is 100000 light years the thickness of the disk is about 2000 light years it's a thin disk and it's at a distance of about 28000 light years away from the center which is approximately 8.5 kiloparsecs is the distance over here and the mass of the milky way is approximately this right so um now we'll come up to the basic topic which we are going to talk about today which is galaxy photometry right or photometry we are counting the photons coming from our galaxy so let's see this is a picture of so what is photometry photo photo is photons and photometry metry is to measure so photometry is the measurement of the light coming from an object right and uh, <clears throat> how do we actually classify galaxies so we classify galaxy into what we call morphological types right in a in a minute i'll show you what is a morphological type and that's basically based on our visual impression of the images so you look at the image of a galaxy you see spiral arms Dear viewers, our Priya, there is some technical problems. We are sorry about that, but our honorable guest, Dr. Priya Hasan, ma'am, will be there with us within some minutes. I think I request you to stay here and be with us and hear the amazing session by Dr. Priya Hasan, ma'am. And we, you are watching this live from Jamal Nazrul Islam Astronomy Club, just official Facebook page, and our honorable guest, Dr. Priya Hasan, ma'am, who is the assistant professor of Department of Physics. Our Maulana Azad National Urdu University at Hyderabad will be connected with us within few minutes. I request you to wait for her. Dear viewers, I think there is some network issue in India, so she will be there within some minutes.
you have been watching this live from Jamal Nuzul Islam Astronomy Club just official Facebook page our today's topic was on the uh, quantifying uh, galaxy morphology our honorable guest Dr. Priya Hassan ma'am was explaining very clearly and we have got to know about some uh, topics like the historical purpose of galaxy and morphology our place in the milky way galaxy the extinctions and their uh, extinction errors and other galaxy the composition the components of uh, galaxies and the galaxy parameter she has been uh, doing her uh, the Thank you. There is a comment we get from the Strat Urmi. She is saying that they, that is an amazing session. Thank you, Strat Urmi. And you have been watching this live from Jamal Nazrul Islam Astronomy Club and our Honorable Guest Dr. Priya Hassan, ma'am, from uh, Department of Physics of Maulana Azad National Urdu University uh, in Hyderabad it will be there with us within some minutes. She is facing some internet issues and I hope our viewers, you will wait for her and you will enjoy an amazing session till the end. There is a, a comment from Sheikh Alvi Farhan. He had sh said that great fan of Priya Hassan ma'am, surely. She, our honorable guest, Dr. Priya Hassan ma'am, is surely an amazing personality and she has explained everything so clearly and I'm sure all the audience uh, has already, uh, will get to the fan of Priya Hassan ma'am. And she will be there within some minutes. Please wait for her. And we are really sorry for the technical issues.
dear viewers i am really sorry for the inconvenience uh, there is some technical issues for that uh, our honorable guest dr pia hasan ma'am cannot join uh, join us in this session but don't be disheartened she will be with us uh, another day with this topic the quantifying galaxy morphology on this topic we will have her another day we hope so and it's time to wrap up uh, we appreciate your uh, time and we hope we will have you another day and um, you are, you have been watching this live from jamal nuzul islam astronomy club just off shelf facebook page and we'll see you another day thank you and it's time to wrap up